All right, so y'all did 5.3 last time, I'm pretty sure. It looked like um, the sub I had finished it, but I wanted to see if anybody had any questions before we move on to 5.4. So it's just possible with any function that has an error type derivative, right? Like you're evaluating it. Um, not, I mean, there's it's So the function has to be differentiable. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in general, you know, lots of kinds of functions have definite integrals. Uh, this specific theorem we all talked about on, on Wednesday applies only to differentiable functions. Um, so, and one thing I want to be, there's one thing that's implied here that's important is that our differentiable function is continuous. So, yeah, that, that by default, yes. So all continuous functions are um, are integral by this theorem here. So if you find that antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints, and the difference between them is the value of the integral, um, that applies to continuous functions, differentiable functions. Um, but what about functions that aren't aren't differentiable? I think the last example he went through you through with y'all was the. Uh, involved in absolute value, right? So you were trying to find the distance that something travels, but that thing is moving backwards sometimes, forwards other times. So because of that, you have to integrate the absolute value of that function. And something we've talked about with absolute value functions is that they are inherently undifferentiable at those points where they you know, bounce, metaphorically speaking. So that's why he, had to break that function into multiple pieces and integrate each one of them individually. But yeah, if the function is just continuous, um, then this evaluation theorem holds true. Which is the that's the that was the big takeaway from from last time. And I know you did some uh, some physical representations, so using velocity and speed, distance, displacement, that kind of stuff. But yeah, the big takeaway was this theorem here. Any other questions? Applying it seemed to make sense. All right, cool. Let's jump on to 5.4 then. So this is the last section I have for you. Um, almost certainly not going to finish it today. Probably finish it sometime Monday, and then Wednesday and Friday I'll set aside for review. Uh, so whatever questions you have, uh, bring them to class at any time after, basically Wednesday or Friday, and we'll we'll talk about it. But then, you know, after next week, we're going or I'm not going to see you until the final. Are there any sections you want to go for this? Yeah. So, yeah, 5.3 I'll put up. Why are you here? 5.3 uh, I'll put up uh, tonight. I mean, I'll probably put up both tonight. I'll, I'll try to figure out what the due dates are going to be. Uh, but, yeah, those. so really the, there's one quiz left, these two web work sections left, and then the final, and that's it. So uh, I know I put this on Canvas, but I'll remind if, if anybody wants to check in, to see where uh, to kind of talk about where they are going into the final. Let's do it. All right. So this is all about the fundamental theorem of calculus, which um, really you got a big taste of on, on Wednesday. And the fundamental theorem of calculus is basically this idea that joins, you know, these two things, derivatives and integrals, and really highlighting the fact that they're not different. They're different sides of the same coin. So Let's build up to another idea here. Um, I have two functions here. One is this, you know, very simple linear function f of t equals two t, and this other function a of x, which is, you know, this stranger function that's based on an integral. So let's figure out if we can say something a little more, you know, a little different about what a of x is. 
So let's do this. Let's find these five points, A of zero, A of one, and so on. What do we think A of zero would be equal to based on the definition of what the function A looks like? Zero, because it's just, it's going to be an integral to zero, zero. Right, so does it even matter what the function is in, the, in that case? So correct, this integral is zero. Does it matter what the function is that I'm integrating in that case? No. Anytime you're interviewing, inter, sorry, anytime you're integrating over a interval with no width, that has to happen. All right, so how about A of one? A of one is the integral from zero to one of two t dt. How do we evaluate that? Is it t squared? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then, Evaluated from zero to one. Uh, one squared minus zero squared is one. Yep. And by the way, I, I didn't look carefully at his notes before I posted them. So if I'm using notation that's any different from what he did, let me know. But I, I doubt that I am. I just want to be sure. So A, one, A of one is one. What is A of two going to be? So antiderivative, is the antiderivative going to be the same every time? Yeah. yeah. So really what we're varying, I'm just moving the right end point of this interval. So what's A3, A3 going to be? We okay if I just jump to the end there? So if you want to go through the integration definition for x equals 3 and x equals 4, you'll see that that integration process does deliver 9 and 16. So yeah, if you want to go back um, and just kind of practice that and, and find those things out, you can definitely do that. For now, I'll just, I'll give you that those values are nine and 16. Is that surprising at all? So based on what we found, can we say in general what A of X is? Okay. It's X squared, right? Which, you know, based on what you now know about how integrals and derivatives, how they kind of play together. Doesn't sound like it's a huge surprise and it really shouldn't be. Yeah, so if f of t is some function and I have some other function that's based on its integral, which now you know it means it's based on its antiderivative, that should be x squared. Any questions about that? Okay. So one thing I did see in his notes is he really called the evaluation theorem, the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, which it kind of is. I don't know, it seems weird to see part two of something before part one. Um, but again, these are numbered in the order that people developed and proved them, not the order it makes sense to show to somebody else. So part one is of the fundamental theorem of calculus is this. So if I have some continuous function, F, then I can build this other function, capital A, that's defined like this. So, and that capital A stands for accumulation, which is kind of what an integral does. It adds up a bunch of stuff and delivers a final total. So I think right now it might not make any sense why this thing is at all valuable, but really what we're, what's valuable about this function is that capital A is an antiderivative for whatever that function is. So again, ha having seen the evaluation theorem already, probably, probably a small addition as opposed to this monumental thing. Uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus is really the power of it is uniting these two branches of calculus, derivatives and integrals. Uh, they're really just different flavors of the same thing.
So, and that's because they're both related by derivatives. Yeah, so by or by derivatives, depending on which direction you want to think of it as. Um, but yeah, so if you have a function, yeah, a, the derivative of one. If you so, if you have f and you take its derivative, the integral of that derivative is whatever you had is the function you had before. So those the processes of differentiation and integration are inverse of each other. Uh, another thing we can say is that a prime of x is f of x. So if I'm telling you that a is an antiderivative for f, then I'm also telling you the derivative of a is f. Those two things, I'm just using different words to tell you the same idea. Oh, sorry, I have more bullets. So again, the, the, the word fundamental there is because that's what calculus is built on, the, the idea that these two things are united. All right, so I have this function here. G of X is some integral from A to X of some function F of T, or I know what the function F of T is. So can I find what G of X and G prime of X are? Uh, let's fill in the things that I know so far. So I know that g of x is equal to the integral from one to x of t squared dt. Oh, that is what g of x is. Um, some terms you might hear, like that's like an open form. Like that is g of x, but you know it's kind of hard to make calculations from that. It's kind of hard to go to your calculator with. If I asked you what g of four was, that would be, it would take you a little while to get there. So what I'm really looking for is a more closed formula. How would we figure out what g of x or what g prime of x is? Should we try some values? So let's try a couple. So this, inter this interval begins at one, so let's, Start there. What's g of one? Zero, right? Why? Right. So it's a it's an interval with no width. What about this? How'd you get three? Uh, two squared minus one squared. Do not want to do two squared minus one squared. So this is an integral, right? Um, and you could you so for whatever for what it's worth, that's a very common mistake when we're first learning integrals. You need the antiderivative. You don't just work with the, the function. So if I want to integrate something, I have to I have to deal with its antiderivative. So one third t to the third. Yeah, so I have to deal with that antiderivative. So one third t cubed, and then evaluate that thing from one to two. So that'll be eight thirds minus one third, which is seven thirds. Okay, I, not obvious, right? So let's at least get one more. Uh, Antiderivative is always gonna be one third T cubed. Now from three to one, so this will be 27 thirds. 27 thirds minus one third equals 26 thirds. We see a pattern yet? Okay, there's no pattern in those like, or Garrett, what do you see? Uh, it's just x, x to the third divided by three minus one third. X to the third divided by three minus one third. Let's write that off to the side and test it out. So we got g of x perhaps equal to x cubed over three minus the third. Does that work with the three values we have so far of one, two, and three? Uh, 
I think it does. Because G of one is zero, right? G of one for Garrett's formula would be one third minus one third. So I think I think the first three are consistent. And also, yeah, looking at these end results, it's hard to see any pattern emerging, but like what's the dial I'm actually turning here? The only thing I'm really modifying is the end is the end is the right end of this interval. Which manifests itself here, right? So one third minus one third, eight thirds minus one third, twenty-seven thirds minus one third. So basically, this thing is the variable, right? So the next one would be sixty-four thirds minus one third. So I'm going to say yes. This is this is g of x. Can we find g prime of x then? The antiderivative of G? What's the derivative of Garrett's thing, Garrett? X squared. So look at the, the, the relationship between G prime and F. They're, they look similar, right? Is that a coincidence or is that what's supposed to happen? Okay, so maybe I should go back to look at. So fundamental theorem of calculus says this, if I have some function and I wanna make some new function based on the integral of that function, that by definition is an antiderivative, right? So let's look at the formula for G that Garrett gave us. X cubed over three minus one third. Is that an antiderivative of F? Yeah, absolutely. That's what, that's what I'm getting at. So, um, so I, I gave you a function f written in terms of t, but couldn't I also say this? f of x equals x squared. I mean, that's really that's really just a symbol. I can I say f of fire emoji equals fire emoji squared. It doesn't really matter. It's just that function squares things. So, and that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus does for us. It, it gives us this formal relationship between derivatives and Integrals. So yes, if f of t is that function, this thing right here is something that integrates that function, and then I take a derivative of that. If I integrate something and take a derivative of it, I have undone the operation, right? So yes, I have all of this to show that really because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, those things, those are always consequences. Um, Basically, if you take a, if you taking the derivative of that antiderivative function, will just give me whatever function I began with. So, g prime of x equals x squared, f of x equals x squared. Not a coincidence. That's what that will always happen. Um, the caveat with the anti or the antiderivative is that if a function has an antiderivative, does it have only that antiderivative? No, it has infinitely many, right? They're all joined by, I mean, they're all, they all are different by a constant. So um, this g of x equals x cubed over three minus the third, that would be a little different if this a value was something different. Any questions on how that works? What is a prime of x if that's my function? Okay. What do you mean by just that? So a prime of x equals uh, t q plus t. So really close, except it's actually going to be, yes. it'll be in terms of x and I'll, that's a very subtle thing, but it's also a very important thing. So I'll explain that, but first, yes, this is, this is the, this is a prime. So 
So let's talk about you know what these different symbols are doing. So let's look at inside this integral first. And this is the first way I'll talk about the jobs that T and X have here. Inside this integral, what's the thing that varies? T. It's T, right? X is essentially a constant. X is just the, the thing that represents the, the right end of that interval. It's, it's where I stop integrating. So inside the integral, the variable is t. And that's why you have to use two different symbols. If I had x playing both roles, it's, it's very ambiguous. It's not well-defined what's going on. So let me, by the way, does it bother anybody that there's not like a constant on this thing? One thing I want to point out is this. Can we find the antiderivative of that function? Maybe yeah, I should ask this way. Does the antiderivative exist? It exists, right? It's a continuous function, so it must have an antiderivative. I actually don't have a good idea how to find it, but that's okay. Um, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that since that function, you know, the integral inside the, the integral is continuous, its antiderivative exists. So if I take the derivative of that antiderivative, I have that function. So it makes sense. I'm now I'm jump, we're jumping a lot of layers with each one of these things. I'll make sure we're okay with how they're all behaving and interacting with each other. We got plenty of time to talk about this if we if we need to. Okay. How about this thing? So I want to take a derivative of that. What would that derivative be? Oh, the derivative? Uh, one over one plus x squared, or t squared. I think I might have confused you. I'm not taking the two derivatives here. I just want the derivative of that integral. And then it's from zero to x cubed? It's from zero to x cubed. Okay. So I think it's been a while since I've done this, but let's talk about, let's do the block diagram here. And this might be a little hard to think about, but it's worth talking about. X is our basic input. What's the first thing that happens to x in this, this thing here? I don't think it gets, I don't think I take the arctangent back yet, right? It gets cubed first. So first thing that happens is that value of X gets cubed. And then I have X cubed. Then what happens to that X cubed? That's a little bit harder to see. So let's, let's pick a value, let's say X equals two. All right, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna evaluate this thing if x equals two? All right, first I'm gonna say, all right, let's cube two. And then I get eight. So now I have the integral from zero to eight of r tangent t t. So then I'm just gonna take that integral, right? So I'm gonna scoop up all that integral stuff and call that the, the second block here. So I'm gonna integrate from zero to, um, x cubed of f of t dt. And then what comes out is, actually I should call this x, huh? So really what we're doing here is a derivative, right? Well, the derivative of that angle. But really what we have here is we have a composite function. X gets cubed first, and then that X cubed gets used as the upper limit of integration. Is that a term I've used? Is that the limit of integration? Okay, so limits of integration are essentially this. If you take a definite integral, definite integral by definition has to have an interval beginning and an interval end. 
That's the lower limit and the upper limit of integration. So the limits of integration are basically ends of the, the interval that you're integrating on. So first thing that happens to x is it gets cubed. Then the next thing that happens, then what happens to the x cubed is it gets used as the upper limit of integration for some integral. So we're taking a derivative of some composite function. What's the thing you have to use when you're taking a derivative of a, a layered function like this? Chain rule. chain rule, right? So now we're gonna use chain rule to differentiate this thing from the outside in. What's the derivative of this thing? What is that thing? It's not just arc tan x, it's more than that, right? It's the integral. So that step right there is integration. I want to take a derivative of that integral. What is the derivative of an integral? It's just whatever the integrand is, right? So the derivative of that integral is just going to become arc tangent of something. But what is the something? X cubed. X cubed. So that's the derivative of that integral, you know, the integral function part of this composite. So that's the outside layer. How do we continue? And then where did three x squared come from? That's the x to the third. Right. So yeah, basically our tangent of x cubed times the derivative of x cubed, which all told is 3x squared arc tangent x cubed. And that's the derivative of the integral. That's the derivative of the integral. So the one, like the ones we just did, you know, was from constant to x, right? Just x. So because of that, don't really need to involve chain rule. Basically, you know, my block diagram will look like this. X gets fed into an integral, and then that's the only thing you're really dealing with. So the complication here comes from the fact that your inner function is, is something that's not trivial. Any questions here? Okay. How about this one? Integrating over some variable x, some constant eight over t to the seven dt. To the seven dt six is just an x. So what? Is it just seven t to the power of it? What's the issue with this one? Right. So we have ways of dealing with that. That, is, that does cause a little bit of a, you know, we have to be careful about it. So, you know, the fun, fundamental theorem of calculus is written that, you know, yeah, I'm trying to remember the, the, the exact notation I gave you for the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it was the integral from A to X of F of T dt. Pretty sure it was like that. But I said from A to X, right? Not like zero or one or some other constant. But it's a constant to X, right? We have the exact opposite situation. Solomon, is there something you want to do there? Uh, why? Like you can get just the reverse value if you reverse the integrals. So, so I can reverse. So if I integrate from eight to X, over the same function, am I just allowed to do that? It's negative now, okay. That's what I wanted to make sure I remember. So yeah, reversing the limits of integration gets you the opposite integral. So this is something, this is something you can deal with. 
Um, and again, I'm trying to find the derivative of this. So I'm gonna use that minus sign as, so I'm really trying to find that, right? But is that a derivative you can now take? What is that derivative? It's not negative seven X to the sixth. Let's do this. Let's actually, let's, let's bypass the fundamental theorem of calculus and actually do this with an antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of c to the seventh? What's that? 17 to the sixth. That's the derivative. Oh, antiderivative. Yeah. Okay. One over 18 to the eighth. So this antiderivative would be, take that negative, negative one eighth, t to the eighth, and I'm gonna integrate that from eight to x, right? So this would be a negative one eighth, and nah, let's do a new line. Negative one eighth, x to the eighth, minus, minus one eighth, um, eight to the eighth. And I'm gonna leave that like that for now. So, Sorry about all the confusion with me leaving stuff off like this, but I think this is gonna be valuable to do this the long way. Are we okay with this being that integral? Found the, the anti-derivative, negative one or one eighth T eight, T to the eighth, evaluated at both limits. So now I have this thing. Um, so this right here is equal to this integral. But what was the thing I wanted to figure out in general, I want to find the derivative of this, right? So what is the derivative of the thing we just got with respect to X? Negative. Um, yeah, negative X to the seventh, right? What happens to that other term? Yeah, that's why I didn't evaluate it. It's a constant and it's gonna go vanish when I take root. So uh, we we bypassed the or we didn't use the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? But what do you see about where we began and where we ended up? So back to just that is the function, right? We, the function we started with was whatever, yeah. Take the input raised to the seventh power. Where's the negative sign come from? Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, big thing, to, big, two big things to notice here is that, or maybe the one new thing is that, yeah, feel free to flip the limits of integration if it makes things more convenient for you. Any questions here? Okay. All right. How about this thing? Derek, you've seen displayed display. No, not display, they just. Or I don't know what word to use. You, you reacted in a way. Why, what were you reacting to? Um, is it two x? Uh, variables in both spots. So you got variables in both spots, right? Fundamental theorem of calculus isn't really equipped to deal with that. But does that mean we're done? So again, I'll remind you what the fundamental theorem of calculus looks like. You know, it's really only structured for integrating from a constant to some variable over some integrand function. Is there a way I can get there, Garrett? Can you separate it since we separate it? How? Uh, sign x to one. So let's try this. Is 
Is the thing that I am finishing writing down true? Here it says yes, but it's his idea. What do the rest of us think? Is it legal to split up an integral in general the way we did? It's still the same distance. Yeah. Fine. As long as you split, so you took, you took an integral of one function over a certain interval and you split that integral into two pieces. But not the integral, the interval. Do they have to be equal size pieces? No. They just have to, they just have to constitute the entire interval that you start with, which it does. And now they have both, now and either one of those things has constant. But either, both of those intervals have constants, you know, bookending one side of them. So does that allow us to use the fundamental theorem of calculus? Is there anything else we'd like to do before we, you know, take that derivative? Or he could have chosen what? Well, so he chose one. What else could he have chosen? Anything. Anything in it. Um, doesn't have to be between them. No, let me show you. Um, yeah, I'll illustrate that in a second, but it does not have to be in, in between them. I'll, I'll for, for now take that on faith. Um, if we have a couple minutes, I'll show you why. But what is the only important thing that as far as what you're just and it works? Why does it work? Because the, the two intervals now equal the first right. And that only happens because these are equal, right? Yeah, because they, they but the second thing. It could be any constant in the world. And any, any constant you could think of would make that work. And I'll I'll try to give you an example to convince you in a second. Okay, so this is all good so far. Is there anything else we should do to kind of clean things up before we try to take a derivative? So look at the way that the fundamental theorem of calculus works. Think about what, think about what we had to do for the last one. Oh, the sine x has to, yes, reverse that. I would reverse that one. So, That's a good move. What about now? Are we ready for the derivative? We can handle them one integral at a time. Uh, let's try it and see, see where we end up. So I'm going to call this thing h of x just because I don't want to write the whole thing down again. So what is the derivative of So that first integral, what's that derivative going to be? Go ahead. Negative cosine x times the root, uh, square root of? Do we agree with that? Okay, so. so, so do you guys think the derivative of that by square root of sine x plus one, or is it good like that? Do we have to say the derivative of the square root of sine x plus one? So let's reflect on the power of a, uh, um, the chain rule, I don't think, is what Sol Solomon's really asking about is, is this confusion about what things do we have to differentiate and what things do we have to integrate? So I'm going to reflect or refer us back to this example we did a minute ago. So we took a derivative for this one, right? Is it something we actually needed to do? 
So if we would, I mean, and we're still learning how to use this theorem, which is great. It's the first, the first thing you're looking at it. But because of that theorem, you know, so two things here. We never took a derivative of this function. We took an antiderivative of it. Do we need that? No. Right. So from a practical standpoint, that's that's a powerful thing about this theorem is that um, no, you don't need to either differentiate or anti-differentiate the function inside the integral. It's just square root of uh, the well square root of x plus one. Negative. Yeah. So let's let me ask all things here. Why did sine of x replace t plus t to the t? Because that's the derivative of this. Yeah. So that's that's a changeable consequence. So we're composing this function. Basically, the first thing that happens to x is it gets sine taken of it, and then it gets integrated, you know, in this package here. So that's why t becomes sine of x. What about this negative cosine? Or sorry, what about this cosine of x? Where did that come from? Uh, no, it's just a derivative. Okay. This is the derivative. So cosine x is the derivative of what? Sine x. Is that also where the negative comes from? No, that comes from the that comes from us flipping it. Okay. So just want to make sure we know why all the things that happened happened. So I, I like that term. That one's good. What about the next derivative? Go ahead, Gary. Two x root x squared plus two. What do we think? Okay. Yeah, I like it. So I kind of threw every wrinkle I could think of at you with this one, at that with that one, but be methodical and yeah. you know, just all the things you have to do to manipulate this. And if you got to do them one at a time, do them one at a time. Uh, any questions about how we wind up with that here? Okay. Um, the one example I wanted to talk about was, let's say I want to integrate from zero to five of x dx. No reason you do this, but could you do this? The integral from zero to negative two of x dx plus the integral from negative two to five of x dx. Is that okay? So, yeah, and that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and, and you could work it out algebraically and find out that those both those sides are equal. I could do this. And I promise you that this thing right here would annihilate the integral from negative two to zero. But basically all that to say that even if the constant doesn't make sense, even if it's not in the middle of whatever the larger interval is, um, but that integration is still gonna be the same. And you, you can still write it the exact same way. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if Garrett would have said, instead of one, just generic A, we're fine. So long as that constant is consistent. So like where you're breaking up the interval is basically A is the end point of one, uh, sorry, the right end of one interval and the left of the next, you're fine. Um, yeah, let's not, so let's talk about this. So if you had a set of real numbers, like if you had 20 numbers, like if I took everyone's age in here in days, how would you find the average of that? Out of them together then divided by the number. Of right. So add them all together divided by what you got, right? So if you have a certain like a countable set, like a finite number of numbers, you can do that, right? What if you have infinitely many numbers? How would you find an average? Does that even make sense to talk about? So that's one of the last things we're going to talk about. And we're just going to kind of dip our toe in right now. We'll, we'll do more, uh, more detailed things in the next week. But basically what we're trying to get after is this. This function right here, this curve from 0 to 24, or from t equals 0 to t equals 24, 
you know, how many how many F of T values or how many capital T values are, are represented there? Is it 24? Is it more? It's infinitely many, right? So even though there are infinitely many numbers, you can get an average. So basically, this blue line here, this horizontal blue line is the average of all of these, all of those black uh, values. You can actually average them all out, even though, you know, if you were to list them, you would know it's done. So now that I've told you it can be done, how could we go about finding what that average value is? So that's essentially what I'm asking here. The title of that slide is average value of function. I want to take a function that has, you know, by definition, infinitely many things. I want to average those infinite. I want to average those infinitely many things together. Solomon? Is it uh, for functions? Is it only for like trade repeating function? No, I mean, that function right there is probably not repeating, but I could definitely find an average for it. I mean, so it looks like you're just because you're not you're not actually averaging infinite infinite numbers. You're just averaging like twenty four to zero. It looks like. So yeah, but how many numbers are there between zero and twenty four? Well, there are infinite. What I'm saying is you're not actually like. Is, is it that you're actually averaging infinite, or are you just taking an estimate? It won't be an estimate. It'll be exact. Okay. Um. I mean, that might be a way to start, but what if I have a function that looks like this? So if I average the absolute minimum with the absolute maximum, um, that, that's probably not a good representation of that thing because it's near its maximum for most of, much, for most of that interval. But we're talking, we're, we're thinking about it. I mean, that would obviously be a lot more faithful to this thing. Yeah. Um, but we want something we can use in general. Anything else we could try? And back to your, your question, Jarek. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying the interval is like, I'm not saying the interval is like unbounded. Yeah. Clearly zero is the minimum X value, T value, 24 is the maximum T value. Mm -hmm. But how many T values are between zero and 24? Oh, it's yeah. only many. And how many, so, and because of that, there are yeah, infinitely many uh, Y values. Just hypothesizing that maybe you only use the so, points to average it. Oh, okay. So, no, we, so, yeah, we, we're still going to use all of them. Okay. Um, so, we'll talk about that more uh, Monday, but, yeah, so basically what we're going to do, um, I think this is the last thing we're actually going to talk about is how do you take something on a closed interval? And it doesn't have to be a closed interval, but... How do you find the average of a set of numbers that really is infinite, has infinitely many things? That's possible. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that on Monday. Um, yeah, otherwise I'll see you then. Have a good weekend.